Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD podcast. Today we have a smart kid here, a doc who's he, he's uh, written at least one book. I don't know if you have more than one book, but uh, <laughs> a good USC guy like myself. And so we have the West Coast guys here. And Trogue's chickened out because he knew he'd be outnumbered. No, he has a sinus infection. He's kind of he looked terrible today. And so I'm like, Tro, I got it. We'll do this thing. So Dr. Lufkin, welcome, man. So great to have you. It's been a way too long waiting for you to get here, but uh, here we are. Well, yeah, I, I, like I said before we went on recording, Brian, uh, I'm a huge fan of the work that you do and, and Tro does. I love your podcast. I follow all the stuff. So it's a it's a great honor for me to be on the program today. This is this is going to be fun. Well, it's fun. And, and I love like on Twitter. You're one of my favorite guys. Like you post up. I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's saying what I'm thinking. And I'm afraid to say sometimes. But, <laughs> yeah. So so how let's go back. Like you're a, a classic classically trained doc like myself and what happened like how what are along the line did you start saying hey wait a minute something's crazy here like we need to we need to start focusing on different outcomes or different treatment plans yeah basically i'm just uh i'm i'm sort of the medical establishment i i spent my whole career as a medical school professor initially a full time at at uh, UCLA and and now at USC uh on the volunteer side but Basically, I just um, my background was radiology, so I, I approached it from the medical imaging side. But like so many of our colleagues in this space, you know, Phil Ovedia and others, you know, they they've been faced with a personal challenge that kind of woke them up to, you know, what was going on. And for me, you know, I was raised. Uh, my mom was a dietitian, so. I follow, you know, we religiously follow the food pyramid. You know, we we avoided the yolks and the eggs because of the cholesterol. We, you know, we switched from butter with saturated fat to what we thought was healthier, margarine with trans fats and seed oils, you know, and we we ate low fat food, which of course is high carbohydrate food. And um, but I didn't know the difference and that didn't really affect me. I, I went on to medical school and then joined the faculty at UCLA and did a bunch of work. Uh, you know, I I guess I want to make it clear that I, I'm not I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm not I'm I'm really part of the establishment. I mean, I I write papers. I, I I've written hundreds of papers, peer reviewed papers. My labs got millions of dollars in um, research funding from drug companies, from NIH, from the federal government and from a device manufacturer. So I'm really, you know, I was perfectly happy. I had no bone to pick with the medical establishment. They were taking good care of me. But basically what happened was um, I came down with four chronic diseases that uh, suddenly out of the blue that um, that I thought were unrelated. And I went to all the specialists and they told me, yeah, these are basically more or less unrelated, but don't worry we're going to give you medicines that you'll have to take for the rest of your life. But these medicines, they assured me, would not only take care of the symptoms, but they would also reverse the underlying cause or not reverse it, but at least manage the disease. And um, and they mentioned lifestyle a little bit, but they said, you know, it was sort of like, um, you know, you could try lifestyle if you want, but doesn't, you know, it doesn't really work in our experience. And you really need to resign yourself to a lifetime of of these of these uh prescription medications. So that that uh kind of turned me around. I had I had two two kids who were barely in elementary school and I knew if I didn't do something this wasn't going to end well. I knew enough about the diseases and everything. And so I just went back to the books and looked at things and Gary Taubes was a friend of mine. I never really read his books, but so I went back and started reading what he wrote and Nina Teicholz and, you know, zillions of other people. And I realized there's this growing body of evidence that, um, that the diseases I had um, 
and most of the chronic diseases were commonly linked and that they could be reversed with uh, lifestyle. And I wound up, long story short, I uh, changed my lifestyle and reversed all the diseases and um, got off all medicines. And now um, I'm kind of making it my my mission to help other people understand this themselves and, you know, not not get caught in the same trap that I was caught in. So what happened? Did you get blowback when you started changing? Like the, I, I kind of have a similar story too. I was gaining weight. I'm doing like green shakes every day and Melba toast and rice crackers and all that kind of stuff. And with a little bit of peanut butter on it, you know, whole wheat toast, you know, the, the food pyramid too. And I'm getting pre-diabetic. I'm like, what is wrong with this? I'm working out six days a week. I'm not lazy. Maybe it's stress, maybe other factors, which the more we're around, the more we realize the effect of stress on us. But, uh, you know, I started doing low carb. A lot of the, my partners are like, what the heck are you doing, man? You're telling people not to eat like Fruit Loops in the morning or like Honey Night Cheerios. Those are healthy. Those are heart healthy. Why would you tell this heart patient not to do that? And so it's amazing when you start looking at it. You know, my influences were, you know, of course, Gary Gary Taubes, uh, Robert uh, Lustig, um, uh, Jason Fung, of course. And so when I started looking at what these guys are talking about, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, and I had patients have success. I had uh, six in six months, I had 11 people come off insulin. I was like, okay, there's something to this. I've never seen this in my career. So once you start making these changes and seeing, oh, it is not just chronic progressive. And, and, and the point I like you made was, you know, they say, well, you can try lifestyle, but that's not going to work. So try that. So they don't even give you any <laughs> guidance in that. They go, just eat, eat less and eat and exercise more. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and yeah, kudos to Robert Lustig and Jason Fung also great stuff, great books. Jason actually wrote the foreword to my book, so I, I, I yeah. Tell people a, about your book, by the way, before huge, we get caught up. Huge influence. Well, my book has a uh, provocative clickbait title: "Lies I Taught in Medical School," and it it basically lays out my journey here, but it also begins un unwrapping the the misinformation that that. I had taught in the past, and that unfortunately, other people continue to teach even today at leading medical schools. You know, just like you said, that a calorie is a calorie, and if you want to lose weight, exercise more and eat less. So, um, yeah, the book is it's for a lay audience. It's not it's not um, for doctors, although it does have some you know technical information. So doctors would probably enjoy reading it, but. Uh, it hopefully it'll help get the word out to other people. And so it's, yeah, it, it, I just, uh, I was just on a, um, I, I never, I'd forgotten how effective television was, or I never knew how effective television was, but I just appeared on a, a TV show, uh, did like an hour program called uh, American thought leaders. And oh, yeah. it, it was amazing. The, um, yeah. With Yanya awesome. Kellick and oh, uh, yeah, awesome stuff. Yeah. It, it was, it was wonderful. And uh, he was great. They did a great job on the interview. But the day the show aired, my book became a number one bestseller on Amazon, and it hasn't even been released yet. So we'll see how long it stays there. But at least it uh, it got a it got a nice bump from the uh, from the TV. Yeah, it's amazing when people hear that and they, and they see someone with credibility. And I think you could speak better than most people, because I think that's one of the hard things is when you're on the standard medicine model and then say, wait a minute, I'm seeing something different here and, and being courageous enough to stand up and publicly say, because that was our struggle. Tro and I were like, okay, we start talking about this stuff. We put a target on our backs for sure, because we're outside the standard. And then you start realizing, okay, we have hundreds of doctors coming out like yourself that give us credibility by saying, look, here's what I'm doing. And it's working also because most doctors in the system are just burned out and, and exhausted because they're seeing their patients. Here's another drug. Here's another drug. And they just are learning about side effects of all the drugs, you know, counteracting with each other and, and all the problems it can cause. And they become experts at drug interactions rather than saying, how do we get you off the meds? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the evidence is, is, is overwhelming. You know, there are controlled studies. Um, this isn't, this isn't really fringe anymore or it shouldn't be And this. This can dramatically improve patients, change patients' lives. But I think, the the healthcare system, unfortunately, you know, as you know, it's not set up to do this, do lifestyle changes. And what what was a wake up call for me that I never realized, and part of my journey was understanding that um, 
the one the the drugs for most of the chronic diseases and the things like stents for you know cardiovascular disease for a heart attack you know and the, uh, all these things may be life saving in the moment like insulin for diabetes but long term they don't do anything about controlling the progression of the disease and the disease continues on and at the at the basis of these all these all the chronic diseases that will determine our longevity basically in my opinion is metabolic disease which is driven by things like high carbohydrate diets and inflammation which and the, the amazing thing is that when you make these lifestyle interventions you actually do slow the progression and can reverse these diseases things like diabetes things like um even certain cancers, not as a replacement for for surgery or or the usual chemotherapy, but now ketogenic diets, you know, low carb diets are being used. And, you know, you've talked about this before as an adjunct to cancer therapy or, um, you know, cardiovascular disease. You're more likely to die of a heart attack by eating sugar than you are by eating saturated fat, you know. But that isn't well known to people. And if you cut out the the carbs and change your metabolic health, you can actually reverse your cardiovascular disease, which is something a stent doesn't do in the coronary arteries. And then, and then even Alzheimer's disease, there's dramatic evidence that that aggressive low carb diets, you know, ketogenic diets, can for some, not all patients, but actually reverse the brain fog and lower the MOCA scores and wind back the Alzheimer's disease. And it's it's just remarkable that all these chronic diseases all have a fundamental basis somehow tied to carbohydrate metabolism. Yeah, and that was what, what was surprising to me. And we and Tro and I talked about this early on on the Low Carb MD podcast when we started seeing people's mood getting better, addictions getting better. And we mentioned, well, I'm seeing this in my practice too. We, we can't just be outliers. We're on different coasts. So it's not like we're you know doing the same programs necessarily. But when we started seeing that, people like we got attacked by doctors saying, how can you say that diet affects mental health? And now we have you know, Georgia Ede coming out with books and, you know, all of these great docs that are doing, you know, Chris Palmer and they're showing, look, uh, and, and, and as a personal, it, it's kind of amazing right now, but my mom, who I'm hopefully going to interview one of these days on the podcast, because a long history of bipolar disease, her whole family is a disaster with diabetes. All my uncles died younger than me, you know, on her side of the family, because they were just, you know, shoot insulin, eat whatever you want type thing with diabetes. But she went actually went ketogenic over the last several months, and she is the most stable I've, in my entire life of seeing her. And like, she's happy, she's fit, she's looking great, her tremors better, like all these things. And it's sometimes it takes forever for you to see the results, but to see it and and everyone's noticing. Like friends are calling me, going, "Hey, your mom is like really." Like she's, her nature is like, she'll start telling the story. Then I'm like, all of a sudden she's like, wait, we were, you were talking about going to the store. Now you're talking about the lady's shoes and how they got them in Germany, you know, that kind of stuff, just uh, tangentially. Right. But just have her carry on coherent thoughts all the way through. You go like, wow, the brain is working differently. You know, it's pretty yeah. amazing to see these kind of things. Well, I love the story. I, I re repeat, uh, Heather Sanderson, you may have had on the podcast is a, is a, a physician who's a, uh, uh, an advocate of the Dale Bredesen approach to Alzheimer's disease. And she runs a bunch of clinics, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, nursing homes, basically. But the but the perhaps unique thing about her nursing homes are that when people go there with Alzheimer's disease, when they're done, they actually go home. In other words, they get better and go home, which is usually not the story with Alzheimer's disease. In most places, it's a one-way street. You only get worse and worse and worse, and then you die. And part, you know, the the whole Alzheimer's disease is very complex, but at least part of it can benefit from a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And and one thing she does in all her nursing homes as a ketogenic diet. And I and I was talking to her and I said, Heather, how do you know that the ketogenic diet works? You know, do you do you, do you have any experience for it? And she goes, Oh yeah, of course. Mr. Jones, who's an Alzheimer's patient, when he's in ketosis. He recognizes his grandchildren and knows their names and hugs them. When he when he falls out of ketosis by eating some junk food, he's a different person. He doesn't even recognize his kids, his grandkids anymore when they come to see him. It's it's really 
really remarkable. But I wanted to uh, I wanted to follow up about your comment on mental health with Georgia Ede and Chris Palmer and the great work they're doing with psychiatric conditions and 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 ketogenic low carb diets. There, when I heard that, and you know, in talking to them, the interesting thing, you know, I the interesting thing occurred to me and many other people was that wow. If if junk food can make us crazy, you know, not not everybody, but some of us, and it definitely stopping junk food can make some people not crazy, not everybody, but it it helps. I wonder what it's doing to regular people who aren't clinically psychotic or don't have a clinical psychiatric diagnosis. I mean, we all live our lives. We have ups and downs with our wives and our kids and our friends and our employers and, you know. What is eating junk food and the carbs doing to our mental health for the rest of us? You know, we yeah. have, you know, presidents of the country who drink, you know, sugar sodas, you know, of both political parties, I'm sure. But yeah, you ice know, cream they, every day and all that. But yeah, yeah, and that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. And that was something that was surprising to me. And Hal Cranmer, who's kind of doing the same thing as Heather, is that, you know, when you start seeing, the outcomes you see people getting better he's doing great work in in arizona and uh you know we put people on health code who doesn't sponsor this podcast they sponsor my other podcast but you know we're seeing remarkable benefits you go gosh if we don't give them the seed oil stuff with sugar why don't we give them real stuff and see how they do and when you start seeing these miraculous you know as a matter of fact we were doing a podcast with this patient's wife and he walked into the room during during the podcast and this guy was there's videos and pictures of him just being bent over at 90 degrees drooling. A guy who was a previously a brilliant uh, builder that has done tons for humanity, Habitat for Humanity, traveled for 10 years building houses, and then he was he was a pile of mush. Now he's playing catch wow. with his granddaughters, right? And and you go, wow, this is now we can go to the baseball games. Now we can interact instead of sitting there staring at the floor all day. And you see these kind of things, and and so you know, I'm I'm really I haven't met Heather yet, but you have to connect us because I would love to interview oh, yeah. her and what she's doing. Because yeah, definitely. it's amazing when you see that because, you know, and as a matter of fact, this patient, the hospice nurse kept telling the wife, I don't know why you're doing all this red light therapy and do all this. Stuff. It's a chronic progressive disease. He's, he's not going to get better. He was on hospice and now he just got kicked off of hospice <laughs> because he's, he's so <laughs> functional. He's eating by himself and doing everything on his own now. He's dressing himself and ironing his shirts and everything. So when you see these kind of things, you go, man, this is like you. And then it makes you sad because you wonder how many people are just languishing away that if we made an intervention, we can we can really help them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I and you, you mentioned seed oils too, and I, I certainly believe seed oils are uh, something else I avoid in my personal diet and what I recommend. What do you think the re relative contribution is? Um, you know, if you could do one thing, low carb versus no seed oils, what would you recommend? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a hard one. You know, I I I think of all. I mean, I try to minimize your damage, right? You know, I think that, you know, I think when, when I look at like one of the things you touched on too, is what's the effect of stress on all this with high cortisol levels and high stress hormones and being on edge, the sympathetic overdrive all the time. How much is that? Especially as doctors were, were notorious for that, you know, trying to save the world or being burned out and not enjoying what you're doing anymore. Uh, being able, you know, cause we feel guilty. if We sit and look at the ocean for a couple hours or something like that, you know, and, and really try to calm that body down. So I think stress is a huge factor, but I think, yeah, I don't know how much I, I hear great discussions on both sides about seed oils and, and carbon. And it really, I think it really depends if, if you're metabolically healthy, you can eat a lot more carbs than someone else can. If you're metabolically sick, it changes the story. So if you're a weightlifter and you're, you know, like, you know, that's where Tro and Lane Norton get into arguments. Cause it's like, he's seeing the healthiest of the healthy and they're fit, healthy guys with a bunch of muscle mass. Yeah. They can get away with Oreo cookies. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. ideal, <laughs> but they can, but if you're a 400 pound diabetic and your, your A1C is 13, okay. You shouldn't be eating Oreo cookies ever. Right. Until you get your <laughs> metabolic health, then you could, you know, that, that will be something maybe you can look forward to, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's a huge, uh, I think our enemies are inflammation. I think both of those contribute heavily to, to, and, and the problem is most of them come together. You have the processed seed oils and the sugar together and the fat together. And you go, okay, that's a, that's a, you're a sitting duck. Yeah. And, and you mentioned stress and that certainly, you know, drives inflammation. It, it, it can even drive insulin resistance, of course, you know, uh, but I always the thing that that blows me away about stress is unlike carbs or seed oils or grains or you know whatever we we take, it will have an effect on my body regardless of what I think about it. You know I can 
what you know it basically it just acts on my body so i remove them but stress is is so different because stress in my opinion is not a result of what happens to us in the world stress is rather one step back from that in other words stress is a result of how we react to what happens to us in the world so somebody could say i have a stressful life well it's sort of true but you know we all know that one event can be very stressful to one person and that same event could be a joyous event to another person you know even even a painful event like having a baby you know can be very painful but it's joyful and and all and that's why increasingly and something i never never appreciated before but the role of mindset in other words how we view the world you know is the world a dangerous place that hurts me and you know stresses me out and you know i've got to watch out or is the world a beautiful loving place that you know and and it's interesting in longevity uh the the some of the things that drive longevity are the mindset if people feel like well i'm 60 years old now it's time to retire i'm going to die in a couple of years guess what they will on the other hand if you're like William Shatner, who was just at this biohacking conference I was at a couple of weeks ago, and he's 92 years old, and he, you know, it's completely crystal clear. He's busy. He just went to space, you know, with Richard Branson, and he's doing all this stuff. This guy's going to, you know, he, he's got purpose. He's being driven. He's got a great mindset. It makes such a difference. Man, I love you're talking about this because this is so important. I think a lot of when I started talking about this stuff on this podcast, actually, that's why I started my other podcast because people will just talk keto. But the reality is if you're stressed and tense and hate the world and you're bitter at everything and you're on, on this overdrive, you're not going to have the benefits. So when people go, I tried keto, it didn't work. I tried low carb, it didn't work. Or I tried carnivore. Okay, what's your life like? Are you stressed, tense, fighting with your spouse all the time, not sleeping, drinking too much at night? Uh, you know, I say, well, I'm keto, but I'm drinking a gallon of vodka at night because there's no carbs. Like, well, there's going to have a physiologic effect and that's going to affect sleep. And that just affects the cortisol. So all these things are when we start looking at the big picture. Um, and also, you know, as you, as you alluded to earlier too, is like when you're in a, in a, on a good diet and, and eating well, and you're exercising, you manage stress a lot better and finding another outlet for that stress. Right. So a lot of us, we get stressed out and go, I'm a stress eater. I need cookies. Well, what else if we decrease the stress level? Then are you a stress eater anymore if you're not as stressed? Because so many people are, they need something to get them out of bed in the morning. They need something to calm them down at night. And we're on that. We're, we're just drugged up all the time to try to function. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Yeah. And the, 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 this, the stress factor or the, um, uh, well, yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely a big, a big factor there. And, and even in in aging, you know how we how we look. I I've gotten involved in longevity recently out of self interest, but uh, you know, yeah. The older I, we get, the more we get as, in, it. Yeah, as, get interested. Yeah, it in this becomes stuff, right? more and more interesting all yeah. the time, right? Uh, but I um, I was giving it. I was talking to some people about um, superficial appearances of aging. You know, wrinkles, gray hair, whatever. And there's things you can do that will change those you know you can you can dye your hair you can inject botox and make the wrinkles less prominent but i always used to say well you know those just affect the phenotypes of aging they don't really actually change your longevity and then somebody came across with a paper where sure enough people who take botox actually live longer than people who don't now it was a correlative correlation study. So correlation mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. causality. Yeah. But it speaks to the issue of mindset. In other words, someone who cares about themselves and wants to be youthful um, may actually, and the type of person who might use Botox would then, um, in full disclosure, I never have. But uh, anyway, but that yeah, type either. of person <laughs> might... Yeah, might be more likely to live longer than, say, a person who's resigned to aging and saying, screw it, you know, I don't care, I'm going to die 
In a yeah, years no, anyway, I think, you know, I, I think those are good points. And I see it both ways, too, because some people want to be, you know, wearing mini skirts and they're 82 years old and like they're, they don't have the legs they used to have when they were 18. And so the stress of that, like wanting to be, you know, the the, the center of attention to those kind of things. And that could be really stressful. So sometimes it's that stress of, you know, some people I, I get it both ways because some people go, OK, I'm 20 pounds overweight, but I'm happy. I'm doing OK. I'm exercising. I'm, I'm metabolically healthy. OK, I'm not going to be like going to the gym for four hours a day when I'm 70 years old. Right. But but I think a lot of those people who are, you, are using Botox, Botox are also going to be going to the gym and exercising, going for walks and trying to make themselves better. And so that's a confounder for sure. But yeah, there's, there's, I think taking pride in yourself and saying, okay, I don't want to just sit on the couch and watch judge Judy reruns the rest of my life. And, you know, like you were saying, like William Shatner, when you have a motivation to go out and do stuff and you're, you're, you're making a contribution still. So a lot of docs, they retire and they die within a year or two because they're like, what do I do now? I'm not a doctor. Now what? I'm not making a contribution. So they lose their purpose in life. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. I mean, the longevity is fascinating. And what blew me away is that there's literally a revolution going on on longevity. Like, who would have thought that we could slow down aging and even reverse it? And now, you know, there's evidence in animal models and some human models that that's possible. And it's going at a really rapid, rapid space pace, which uh, which is really exciting. But what in diving into that, one of the things I realized that one of the core mechanisms for aging and driving aging goes back to the same things that drives the chronic diseases that we talked about and things like carbohydrate metabolism and inflammation. And uh, there's this uh, one molecule called mTOR that uh, that is, uh, it, you probably, your guests have probably already talked about this, uh, but uh, it it's a it's a fascinating molecule that I, I love talking about. Yeah, I would love to hear more about it because I know some people go, well, if you're mTOR, if you're eating meat, your mTOR is too high and you're going to have all these problems. And people are like, well, if your mTOR is too low, you get into trouble. So maybe it's a balance, right, where you're, you're kind of trying to maximize your benefit from – I would love to hear your take on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, the fascinating thing is mTOR wasn't even discovered until the end of the 20th century. So it's a new molecule, but – belying how late it was discovered it was one of it's arguably the single most powerful switching protein in biology it's conserved over billions of years all the way from yeast to humans so it's it's in every single cell um throughout the animal kingdom and that belies how important it is and it just does one thing it switches it detects the presence of nutrients primarily glucose and if they're present it tells the cell to grow and if nutrients aren't present, it tells the cell not to grow and repair with things like autophagy. And to your point, over you know throughout human history, most most humans, mTOR would switch from being turned on into the growth inflammation mode, where it's healthy to grow. You know, kids need need their epiphyses to you know lengthen and their brain to mature. Um, but it's also important to repair and it would go back and forth and switch back and forth. But long story short, modern man is now in a situation where most of our food today that we consume is junk food, um, which is full of carbohydrates and seed oils, which turns mTOR on all the time. And so there's a a model that there's a hypothesis that turning on mTOR all the time drives aging and even all the chronic diseases that I got, all those diseases, and also all the diseases that are going to kill you and me and everybody else statistically and determine our longevity. So everybody, you know, what's the what's the evidence for that? Well, it turns out there's a there's a drug, a targeted drug that will turn mTOR down into that repair mode. So you could take this drug to force mTOR to be down. Now Full disclosure, you can do the same thing with fasting. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Jason yeah, you can Pung do the like same thing that. with a low carb diet, ketogenic diet, um, restricting things. And in fact, the drug is rapamycin, and you know, people oh, yeah. have heard about it. Oh, and yeah, everything. yeah. But I recommend, I mean, I take rapamycin, but I also dramatically change my lifestyle because we don't really understand these things. We really don't know how they work. And even rapamycin, it appears. There's synergistic effects with 
lifestyle, and even other drugs that amplify its effect beyond just taking rapamycin. But uh, to give you to give your listeners an evident evidence of how powerful this this mTOR effect is, if you take rapamycin, looking at phenotypes of aging like gray hair, baldness, in the mouse model, you give them rapamycin, and the uh, the hair will actually uh, the hair will actually grow back and uh, grow from gray to black in the animal model. Look at wrinkles in humans in a prospective blinded study with rapamycin skin cream. It actually increases the collagen and makes the skin younger. And the FDA has just approved rapamycin for use, not for wrinkles, but for other indications. But it's now available in a cream formation. But mm. turning down mTOR, what about other signs of aging? Periodontal disease. It reverses periodontal disease. Hearing loss, you know, all those Led Zeppelin concerts coming back to haunt us. Well, actually, in the animal model, it increases hair growth in the cochlea, the hair cells, and slows down age-related hearing loss or presbyos presbyosis. Um, the um presbycusis, excuse me. But the um what about menopause? That's the one age-related disease that, you know. Only half the patients, half the population gets, but everybody gets it. When you give rapamycin to, in the animal model, to mice, for example, it increases their litter size, the number of pups in the litter, and it delays the onset of menopause. And now for all these studies, people are using rapamycin to look at humans. But, you know, you're probably going to say, well, hey, nobody dies of wrinkles. Nobody dies of menopause. Nobody dies of baldness. If if rapamycin and mTOR is so fundamental for aging, it's got to affect the diseases that kill us, you know, and it's no secret. There's only four or five diseases that will kill most of us, and that's cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and a, and a couple others. But so is there any evidence for mTOR's effect on cardiovascular disease? Yes. Rapamycin which turns down mTOR, is now FDA approved to coat those stents in the coronary arteries, which means it stops the atherosclerosis better than anything else. And um, because, of course, when you get the stents, like we talked about earlier, you're not really doing anything about the disease. You're just stopping the patient from dying immediately. So their, their disease continues in the rest of their vessels and even in their stent. And that's the problem with stents. They cloud off again. But if you coat them with rapamycin, they don't clot off. And so now people are saying, well, if I take a rapamycin pill, will that slow down cardiovascular disease? Same thing with cancer. Rapamycin is now approved for eight cancers as uh, FDA approved for treatment. Things like metastatic renal cell carcinoma and other things. So rapamycin does that. Alzheimer's disease, which represents really the ultimate failure of the medical industry you know, millions of dollars, decades of work, and not a single pharmaceutical that works. Although we've seen evidence that lifestyle works. Well, in rapamycin, when you give it to the animal model, it reverses the animal model, the mouse model, the mouse Heimer's model of cognitive impairment to the extent that there's even a human style, a human trial now undergoing uh, underway at the University of Texas, a multi-million dollar study on rapamycin for Alzheimer's disease. But the interesting thing, rapamycin, it works by turning down mTOR, which low-carb diets do also, ketogenic diets. So it's amazing that these things all work together. But what I wanted to get out there to your audience was eating a low-carb diet. And if you do it right and you turn down mTOR, you're not only going to lose weight, you're not only going to reverse your type 2 diabetes, but you're going to lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and you're going to improve your phenotypes of aging potentially you know, hearing loss, hair loss, all those things. Yeah, that's one thing that's interesting with Jason Fung has been noting in his clinics is that when people do more fasting, they don't get that extra skin like a lot of times when we're losing weight on a low calorie diet or a, or a low fat diet or maybe even a low carb diet. So you go, man, could this have something to do with with uh, uh, rhabdomycin, rhabdomycin or um, autophagy, you know, eating up all those old fibers that you're you're just burning out, you know? So there's a lot of, you know, Ben Bickman just posted something. Uh, it wasn't his study, but he just reposted it on 
high cortisol levels, breaking down muscle and muscle tissue, joint tissues, uh, um, uh, tendons to raise sugar because telling your body, you got to get out of there. There's a bad thing happening, you know? So I think we're learning a lot more. And I think the other fascinating thing, and I, I don't know how much you've dived into this, uh, with the gut microbiome with dietary change and how that can affect, you know, your, your the, the, phenotype of dementia and Parkinson's and, you know, depression, anxiety. And, and so I think we have a lot to learn because it's such a new area that we just, I thought it was crazy when I first heard, I don't know what you thought when you first heard about like stool trans, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. Stool trans, fecal transplants. Fecal and transplant. I'm got, like, this is a yeah. crazy, you're going to take crap out of someone, put it in someone else. And, and, but talking to experts who do it and you hear their stories, they go, wow, this is incredible. Some of the data they have. Yeah, I mean, uh, it just blew me away. Like another longevity drug, which is also a diabetic drug, is uh, uh, metformin. And nobody, unlike rapamycin, which is targeted clean drug that goes directly to mTOR, nobody really knows how metformin works. You know, AMP kinase, different things, uh, glucose synthesis. Uh, but one one mechanism that is growing in popularity is that it just changes your gut microbiome. And through that mediates everything. I was I was really surprised. And the other thing that blew me away about the gut microbiome is the speed at which it modifies. Like there are some studies now with uh, psychedelics, which you know have amazing possibilities for uh, longevity and other factors. But with a single ayahuasca experience, the gut microbiome changes within 24 hours. It's like what what's going on there? I you know I had no idea that it was so responsive to to what's going on, and then and then just beyond the gut microbiome. Uh, when I went to medical school, we we were taught that the body was essentially sterile, and if there were bacteria in the body, other than certain locations like the gut, it was an infection. But now, of course, we're seeing you know. Um, uh, P. gingivalis in Alzheimer's cells in the brain. We're seeing it in the coronary arteries. We're seeing other other organisms throughout the body. And now we have, you know, microbiomes separate from the gut microbiome. We have the oral microbiome that uh, I, you know, makes nitric oxide. And I've I've stopped using mouthwash because I don't want to kill my oral microbiome like I would with an antibiotic for my gut microbiome and you know, damage the good bacteria that make the nitric oxide, you know, and yeah, and it's so all this stuff is so amazing. And when you I mean, getting back to how we connect all this stuff with stress is, uh, you know, you see, like when people are really stressed that they may not make enough stomach acid, and that affects the small bowel when that when the food gets there. And then if you're not chewing your food, and your your saliva dries up when you're stressed, because your body's trying to conserve everything, and you start realizing me, yeah, I'm not metabolic. So a lot of people like, for instance, stuff we've treated for years, like irritable bowel syndrome, you know, initially, they thought, well, they're just stressed out people and they got this thing. There's nothing wrong with them. We scope them. Everything's normal. Right. But then you start realizing how much the nervous system is affecting that and it's affecting digestion. And, you know, I heard it said, you know, it's like what animal eats when it's stressed besides humans. Like, no, <laughs> you know, a tiger's chasing a deer. It doesn't stop to eat grass on the way out. It gets out of there. Right. This sympathetic overdrive. So you start realizing like we're stressed out all the time. When we're eating and we're not digesting right. And we're not absorbing nutrients. Right. And we're eating poor nutritious foods and, you know, and it, how it all kind of goes together to be a disaster for us. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so much more sensitive to my gut microbiome and, and all the microbiomes, but I used to think I, I'm, I'm a recovering uh, junk food addict. Um, and I used to, um, you know, like many people, I doctor's drink, lounge, right? Yeah. I drink, yeah. Sodas. I would drink first regular sodas, but then I, I thought I'd, I'd smarten up and I just drink diet sodas because those were healthy. Right. And I would drink like several of those a day. And I'm thinking, wow, what's that doing to my gut flora? Just being bathed in, you know, carbonic acid and, you know, all the weird stuff that's in those, those, those uh those uh foods it's it's wild yeah and, and there's so much that we just don't realize and we're we're trying to figure that out how much of an insulin response are we getting to these artificial sweeteners that we're taking and you know there's some interesting data on allulose coming out now and so you go i wonder how much these things either help or hurt us and you know i think i think really that we we can get to the foundational stuff of watch your stress, get enough sleep, don't be drinking too much because that kills the microbiome, but it also affects the stress hormones and cortisol and all these things we're fighting against as we get older. So so anti-aging, you know, the other thing is the more muscle mass we have, the longer we live, 
right? So we've been on this thing of saying, okay, don't eat animal proteins, don't eat eggs. And you go, well, if you don't have enough protein to sustain muscle mass. And as you get older, that muscle is very, very important for metabolic health. And so if we lose that, then we get into trouble also. And then we get into this balance of visceral fat versus muscle mass. And I'm telling you all the time, I can look like, well, I'll do a Sika, like a, it's basically like a Dex, uh, DEXA scan, looking at muscle mass and lean body mass and, and visceral fat. And I, I don't know that I've seen anyone yet with really good muscle mass off the scale with a ton of visceral fat, right? Even mm. if they're overweight, mm. even if they're overweight, if they have muscle mass, that seems to be uh, some somehow blocking the the effects or it it preferentially is pulling from the, the visceral fat, even if the subcutaneous fat is still there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that was the, that was a concern about turning mTOR down into repair mode and everything that people lose muscle mass, you know, so... People take take rapamycin for longevity uh, as an off-label use. They take it once a week. But the studies have shown that for whatever reason, turning mTOR down at least that once a week doesn't doesn't drive sarcopenia or muscle mass loss. It actually actually maintains it. It's it's yeah, it's it's sort of counterintuitive there. But yeah, there there's so many new things happening. I mean the the whole thing about microplastics and, you know, here's my water bottle in full of plastic and my coffee cup from an unnamed uh, company that's plastic. Um, you know, microplastics were always, you know, bubbling in the background. But now, you know, this article just came out with, you know, microplastics in the coronary arteries and, you know, correlated with the severity of plaques. So it seems like microplastics are rising on the on the scale as a possible risk factor not just for overall health, but actually specific things like cardiovascular disease, which is you know the number one killer there. So so many things we have to we have to start paying attention yeah. to. You and it's know? hard because you don't want to be paranoid about everything. You go, let me minimize my risk as much as possible. So everyone's already gonna have the plastic lid or whatever. But trying to say, okay, let me be cautious. Now, can if I can have you know drink out of glass is that better? Then they'll figure out oh it causes there's some chemical in glass that causes trouble. But you know you can get over the top and worry about every dang detail, or you can go, you look, I'm gonna try to minimize my risk, right? I'll drink less frequently or I'll cut down on my Doritos or whatever you're eating. Like, so some people it's like, that's a, such an emotional bond that it's hard to break that. Cause that's their way of coping with life sometimes, you know, like alcohol might be or drugs or whatever. Yeah, no, the, I mean the, the addiction factor for like these junk foods or just making a, a choice to a low carb diet is, is so powerful. And, and I never really appreciated that either. I mean, I, I thought it would just be enough to, you know, write a book and, uh, you know, talk about the dangers of sugar and carbs and, you know, intelligent people would understand it and then stop. But I, I have, uh, you know, I'm sure we all have people like this, a friend of mine, he's a very intelligent man. You know, I explained sugar to him. He got it. You know, he knows how bad it is. He has a terrible calcium score. Next day I see him having his coffee. He's putting sugar in it. And, you know, I, to to your, I realize that it's you know they're they're powerful forces that drive our needs for things, our addictions, and that's why it blew me away when um, all the drugs that are now being associated with longevity, like low dose naltrexone, which is a uh, you know classically an addiction drug for substance addiction, you know serious substance addiction, is now being used with. Uh, Florence Christopher's and other programs on uh, on sugar addiction and uh, coaching programs to so get off carbohydrates. They go on low dose naltrexone, and now even people and fibromyalgia are going... too, right? Yeah, fibromyalgia, and and then the other interesting thing along that line you had mentioned earlier was metformin. They were using, and I thought this is the dumbest thing ever, but they were using metformin for fibromyalgia pain. I was like, how can that, that's a diabetes drug. What does that have to do with fibromyalgia? And you realize, oh, they're hyperinsulinemic, right? They're stressed <laughs> and dense in middle-aged women or whatever. And so lowering that insulin level down, it's like, oh, we could do that with diet, can't we? <laughs> diet yeah. lifestyle. Yeah, well, so it's if, amazing. Yeah, I don't know if your guests have talked about the ITP or the Interventions Testing Program. Uh, it's sort of the gold standard for longevity that the, uh, that the National Institutes of Aging sponsors. They basically take two groups of mice um, and they do it in three labs around the country. They're wild type mice. So they're not lab mice. They're more genetically heterogeneous, but anyway, one group, they just let them live their life, which is about three years. And the other group, they take drugs or green tea or curcumin or ashwagandha and they give them 
whatever the drug is they want. And then they see if there's any difference between the two groups on longevity. And the great thing about this project is because it's funded by the federal government, people can write in and suggest things. So that's why green tea's been tested, you know, statins, CoQ10, uh, NAD supplements, all these things have been tested. And um, none of those worked. Uh, they had no effect. But because they didn't have an effect, it just, if they fail the ITP, it doesn't mean they don't work at all. They just don't work at the dose tested. So there's always a possibility they may work, but there are certain drugs that do work. There's a handful of them, of which rapamycin is the most powerful. It, it knocks these mice out of the park. You know, they live a significant amount longer. But there's another one, another drug called acarvos that also significantly extends mm. the, the, the lifespan of these drugs. And when you combine rapamycin with acarvos, you get a synergistic effect, which is greater than either rapamycin or a carbose by itself. And a carbose is blocking the the glucose absorption in the gut, right? Yeah, that's why I thought your audience would appreciate it because if anybody's hesitant about the harmful effects of carbohydrate, uh, that's exactly a carbose works in the gut. It doesn't even work in the body, really. It's just in the gut, and it blocks, slows carbohydrate absorption and basically flattens the the glucose spikes and, and uh at least in this animal model and a lot of people now uh yours truly included are taking a carbos for longevity um how about berberine added factor yeah berberine is uh it has you know of course has many overlapping properties with metformin although they're slightly different so there's a synergistic effect but yeah berberine people are looking at that even uh this blew me away um the uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, the, you know, Cialis, Viagra, they actually improve lifespan. Um, nobody bothered to look at it because everyone was concerned with ED and that was the big market. But actually, if you think about it, if you dilate blood vessels all over. Nitric oxide, um, right? Yeah, nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is not just blood vessels, but also immune system and and uh, nerve cells. So. Yeah, there's so many, so many surprising, amazing, beautiful effects of drugs and lifestyle that we're seeing that uh, that are occurring in unexpected ways. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I'm glad you're on the cutting edge of all this, you know. And, and you know, sometimes the drugs are necessary. There's meds that can help you and to to overcome some of the sins of the past, you know, when we get metabolically unhealthy. And so, yeah, it's, it's just really exciting to see. And and uh, so, speaking of exciting, tell tell people what you're doing with your next goals in life professionally you're doing an a, uh, hmo plan oh yeah yeah well i um i figured i was doing the d doing the uh reaching out with the book and stuff and all and uh it just did a tv show we just filmed uh, another one in costa rica that's going to come out on the discovery channel and pbs on longevity and all talking about a lot of these things but i realized that to do more, you need to do things like you and Tro are doing with uh, some of these programs to actually make a difference. So long story short, a, a bunch of friends and I got together and we're basically acquiring a managed care organization in Southern California. It's about 100,000 lives. And it turns out these are all Medicare, Medicaid patients. So they're socioeconomically deprived, you know, low income and these people usually don't get health care at all, much less cutting edge health care. And our goal with acquiring this is um, by by controlling and owning this plan, we're able to spend the money on whatever we want. Like we were talking about red light therapy, um, massage. We can do movie theater tickets. We can do whatever we want that will motivate people that makes a difference. And um we're building an incubator on top of it, sort of a Y Combinator type thing that allows new companies to come in or even more mature companies with ideas. And if they want to test them in the sandbox of these, these patients, we'll do it. And to the extent that, that we save money and their treatment is effective, we'll deploy it throughout the organization and, um, and make it work there. And then we're setting up a venture studio on top of it for funding these and we're very, very, very hopeful of that. But I was honest with myself enough to realize that that's really that's good, but it's not enough. If you really want to move the needle, you need to change the next generation of doctors. So toward that goal, 
I'm working with another friend who has a hospital here in Southern California, and we're setting up accredited graduate medical education programs. Uh, we currently have family medicine. We have uh, accredited uh, psychiatry, transitional medicine. We're just setting up radiology that hopefully will start this this summer, and we're going to train doctors in this new model of medicine, and they're they're going to get access to this managed care thing and the Y combinator incubator. And so if they're entrepreneurially oriented or have ideas, they can immediately test it on that population. But anyway, those are some of the things I'm doing for now. And uh, wow, that's <laughs> amazing. I mean, that's we'll so important. That's what we really do. We have to like what you said is, you know, the stuff you taught in, in med school to doctors coming out. I mean, how much is it biased? How much is it? As doctors, we just say, oh, that's what they say. And we just follow the rules and like, okay, this is what works. And you go, wait a minute, why? You know, like <laughs> sliding scale insulin. When you think about it with any sense of common sense, you go, wait, this doesn't make sense. You're giving them sugar in their veins and then you're giving them insulin to lower their sugar levels down. Why are you just not giving the sugar? Because where, where's that sugar going to the fat stores and where we don't want to go and we're increasing risk of infection. So, you know, especially when you have someone who's 40 pounds overweight, maybe it will be better not to give them sugar in their veins and maybe we give them some good nutrition source, you know, while they're there in the hospital. So yeah, they, it's a, it's a, it's hard when you see things that was just sliding scale insulin. Here's what you do. Your, your resident teaches you when you're an intern and then you teach the next intern and it just keeps being passed down without anyone questioning going, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, one of the inspirations for the title of my book, The Lies I Taught in Medical School, was a quote from one of the greatest physicians of all time was Sir William Osler, who practiced at the turn of the century of the, the 1800 century. And he's he has one of the best quotes about medical education. He he actually delivered it to a graduating class of medical students on the day they became doctors. And and the quote is, uh, gentlemen, and at the time, most most doctors were, were male. He said, gentlemen. And they were probably we gentlemen have, back then too, right? Yeah, or they were male, <laughs> if not gentlemen. But yeah, they were gentlemen. Yeah. And he said, uh, gentlemen, we have a confession to make. 50% of what you've just learned in medical, medical school, what we've just taught you is wrong. Furthermore, unfortunately, we don't know which half it is. <laughs> Yeah, and that's and that, the nature yeah. of medical education that we we need to constantly question it because, you know, it's it's all it's all going to be wrong eventually, you know, as we understand things better. Yeah, and that's that's unfortunately, you know, I know at the beginning you said you're not a conspiracy theorist, and I never used to be, but the more I'm around, I see stuff and go, wait a minute, how can this possibly be? Because if 50% of what I teach you is wrong, then you should be able to question 100% of what I'm telling you because we have to figure out which 50% that is. So if you can't question without getting in trouble, then you're never going to find out what that 50% that's wrong. And it's probably way more than 50% <laughs> right at this point. But it's a hard thing when you when there's you know vested interest in money and you know the, all these kind of things. And you know with you starting well, with the irony of, of you starting with this program that you're doing is a big part of the reason I jumped out of the standard medical model was. Uh, you know, I got called in. I, I, I resigned from my old position. I was making pretty good money with an, a big HMO. And uh, I happened to know the head of the HMO. And, you know, we started having a discussion. He goes, are you having a midlife crisis? What's going on? Why are you leaving? I know how much money you made last year, that type of thing. I said, look, it makes me crazy because I'm spending hours with my patients. You're paying me for a 15 minute visit. I'm working through lunch and I'm working. You know, I'm getting home at 830 at night because I really want to help my patients not get diabetes. And I said, I had 11 people in the last six months come off insulin. And I go, you know how much money I'm saving your system with bypass surgery, amputations, you know, all the diabetes complications, all this stuff. And he goes, no, Brian, you're actually costing us money. And I said, how am I costing you money? He said, well, if they don't get the diagnosis and you prevent it, from, I go, because I, I said I have 11 and I have about 70 that I can show you would have gotten diabetes if we didn't intervene on them with lifestyle. And, uh, and, and he said, you're costing us money because we get less funding from the federal government if they don't get those diagnoses, if they get, as you know, the more diagnoses you have, the more you get paid by medic Medicare and Medicaid and all that stuff. So keeping people healthy, then you're like, well, then isn't this a conflict of interest? Because the sicker my patient is, the more I get paid. And he goes, well, that's just the system. I'm like, well, then I can't be part of that system anymore because I, I, my job is to keep the patient healthy, right? Preventive care is what we talk about. But if you prevent things from happening, then you don't get paid for that, <laughs> right? And, yeah. But you're avoiding suffering and all that. So yeah, it's a, it's a so to have... A plan where you're saying, look, let's prevent these problems. And that's how it should, that's how medicine should be. You want doctors like you who say, let's prevent this and we all make more money that way by not having to pay for all these dialysis and all the crazy stuff. 
Yeah, good for you, Brian. Uh, yeah, that's what it, it's good. You stood up for your principles and did that. Uh, well, it wasn't. Even, it, it wasn't just the principles. Yeah. I realized I was killing myself, knowing what I knew. I go, I can't work eighteen hour days all the time and be on call every weekend and do do you know not sleep. So I knew I was killing myself doing that. So it was self preservation. It wasn't all altruistic. But once I got out and I looked back, I was like, oh my goodness, what was I doing? You know what? You know because it's a cost if you can if you. If you care about your pace, if you don't care, you just are a robot and you go through and go, whatever, I'm just putting everyone on drugs and, you know, move on to the next one and get them in and out. But when you really want to help people, you're a detriment to the system and there it's a detriment to you too, personally, right? Because you, you invest so much. And plus you realize 80% of the people really don't care. They're like, give me the drug and let me eat my cookies every day. You know, it's like, but they don't understand the ramifications that are coming. But we, you and I being in practice so long, you see the ramifications and you go, I don't want that for my patients. And I don't want to, you know, it's like you're on a sinking ship that's going out to sea. It's like, I don't want to get on that boat, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's going to sink eventually. So you try to, to, to maximize um, longevity and having ha health, healthy, happy patients who come in and they go, let's just talk about life for an hour. <laughs> you know, that's nice. So, but you know, I, I think, we all have our, our role to play. And I'm hoping like with what you're doing is going to help a lot of younger doctors coming out, having a different mindset of not just following guidelines, but thinking critical thinking of saying, wait a minute, we're doing these and it's not working. Maybe we have to change tax. Right. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I totally, totally agree with that. And so, and so, so doc, how do people track you down? How do they find out about your book? How do they, you know, if they want to sign up for your health plan that you're doing, how do, how do they find you? Yeah, well, the, the health plan is still uh, still in progress, so uh, that will be a couple months off yet. But uh, the um, my website is uh, robertlufkinmd.com. Uh, you can download a free sample of my book of chapter first chapter if you want to check it out, uh, uh, or wait it'll it'll be out in June. You can pre order it there. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, usual social media things. It's all the same. Robert Lufkin, MD is the handle. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Tro's going to be bummed when he hears this, that he missed out because he would have wanted to jump in a few times, I know. But, you know, I think we're all like-minded to say, okay, how do we help the most people that we can and still kind of survive <laughs> financially? But, uh, you know, it, it's really a, I think there's a, a, a tide changing in medicine. I think for the first time in my career, at least, this is the first time that I've seen doctors disparage doctors. Like, you know, people don't trust their doctors anymore. They don't trust the system. And it's, it's kind of sad because we have the most noble profession there is. And to see it where it's at right now, there's hope. When you say, look, we're going to train the new doctors. We're going to do things a different way. And let's see what we can do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's always hope. And and I'm I'm encouraged like you are too, Brian. Yeah, I'm encouraged because I think now we know where we can intervene. If we can give patients good information, like you said, a lot of the stuff we were saying that we thought was true was, were, were lies, like never skip breakfast, you're going to go into starvation mode and die and all the all these things. And we start learning more and more about how physiology works and human history and understanding how, how uh, we tick, then we can really help people. So it's exciting. And I hope there's more people following that. I know Tro and I are working on that too, trying to build a network of docs and people that we can go, okay, look, let's give them the education, the follow-up, the community, the support. If it's going to the movies together, going for a hike together, going and doing these, building these things where people have a purpose or, you know, and I think people listening, you know, and thank you for our Patreon supporters. We greatly appreciate you because we don't take any funding from, from anyone uh, so that we can hopefully tell you the truth and not be biased in what we're saying. But I think it's really important that when we start looking at, at, lifestyle, stress, sleep, you know, all these other factors, not just eating a low carb ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet or whatever it might be is realizing it's that big picture of the stress hormones and, and doing fun stuff. So what do you do for fun doc? So people, I can let people know a little bit. About, you know. Well, uh, my, my two daughters, one teen and one preteen are into volleyball club volleyball. So we're traveling around the country, going to tournaments and that's keeping me busy year round. Uh, so I enjoy doing that being a dad. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. My kids are a little bit older, but they were swimmers. So I was like every weekend I'd work all of that. That was the other thing. I'll be at these swim meets going, oh my gosh, I got so much stuff to do. How long are we going to be sitting here? You know, <laughs> they would swim. I would watch the video at the end of the weekend and they would swim for like six minutes. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> my whole weekend for six minutes of swimming. But but those bonds and, you know, spending that time is super important. So awesome yeah, stuff. <laughs> awesome stuff. And, and thanks again. Thanks for, for joining me. One of, one of these days when your book comes out again, we'll get, we'll get, you, we'll get you on with Tro and we'll talk about it and kind of review it together. 
Well, th thanks, Brian. And thanks for having me on this. And thanks for doing all the great work that you and you and Tro are doing. Yeah, no, thank you. And hopefully we all cross paths again and, and work together. I think that would be pretty awesome. Love what you're yeah. doing. <laughs> Definitely.